I'm Scott out Miller's the 3rd of April 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua and today I'm out in Carlos Canales just hanging out in the field. I got my camera on the tripod and I'm trying to do a lot of videos. I'm actually recording this on Semana Santa weekend so I'm a bit behind but we're catching up quickly and I brought two cameras, three batteries, I got the tripod, I even have my phone for notes. Hopefully we're gonna get a lot done. I'll see you after the bump. Okay, I have a number of updates that I've missed over the last few days just because I've been really busy and I have notes on them and I forgot to put them in the show. On Sunday night, that is the night of the first, uh, it was 97 degrees, like and it has been like this whole week. We've barely come down from 97. That's why we don't like April. 95, we actually find pretty comfortable, but 97 means I have to run the air conditioning in my office. Like that's where it just goes too far. It's also the season when they burn the field. So there's dust and grit in the air. So everything just gets so dirty. Being on air conditioning is worth it. Um, on Sunday, on the 1st, uh, we went out to, I'm sorry, on Saturday, we went out to uh, Jazzy and Thea's place and hung out by the pool uh, and uh, spent the evening there. That was that was our, our night. That was uh, a lot of fun. And then yesterday on the 2nd, because today's the 3rd, um, I actually managed to get out and do three shows. And I thought I was catching up. I thought I was doing great. I got like all this filming done. No, <laughs> it was, it ended up being just barely enough to keep me from falling behind, which seems to be how it is. I get really far behind. I do a bunch of catch up. I feel great. And then, and then every week, some big amount of work comes and I can't catch up at all. Today is the third. It's Monday. And uh, I don't have a whole bunch of news for the day. We're just back to work. This is the week of Semana Santa. So this entire week is busier than normal here in Nicaragua, meaning there's a lot of people out at restaurants, a lot of people out at the bars, a lot of people out at the hotel and on the beach. Uh, but these first couple days, it's just a little bit. By later in the week, it gets really busy. By Thursday, it's nuts. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday are absolutely crazy. So today's topic, that's, that's all the news for now. Uh, today's topic, I'm going to talk again about currency um, because this comes up a lot. Uh, it, there's something about living in Nicaragua. I think we tend to get travelers and expats and people looking to move who are coming specifically from the United States, who are specifically concerned about cost of living and um, tend to be uh, targeted heavily by a lot of, um, I don't know if it's scammers or just a certain type of news, but there's a lot of talk um, of, of things like currency that in most situations people don't talk about, right? Currency is not particularly interesting in most situations and we don't normally need to think about it. And it is true when you're moving to another country and I've done multiple videos on this that, and sorry for the wind, it's, it's quite a windy day. We're up here in Carlos Canales at the top of the hill and uh, all of a sudden it's, I'm worried about it blowing the tripod over. So we only really need to think about currency in regards to moving money from one country to another. That's it. If you start thinking now, if you're an economist, if you're on a national scale, if you're looking at really complicated things, of course, currency values and strengths and weaknesses of different currencies and what's the, you know, uh, the different currencies used for different things around the world, those things start to matter. But as a normal person, as a traveler, as an expat, none of that stuff matters. So I suggest that you start with eliminating all news and discussions. There's a lot of this that I say to people, and, and I really do mean it. I think that people who are looking to move have a tendency uh, to be either targeted or to spend a lot of time reading a lot of stuff that's really unhealthy. Not intentionally to find it to be unhealthy, but it's they're worried about certain types of things and start looking into things that are unnatural and it's a territory where there's a lot of misinformation or misleading information out there. And it's really easy for people to prey on someone who's about to move. They have a lot of apprehension. As that apprehension grows, there becomes more and more ability to be easily misled or distracted by things that simply don't matter. So examples here, um, because this was Axel Foley brought this up and was asking, you know, what, what was my opinion on the weakening of the US dollar? Well, but the US dollar isn't weakening, right? It's, it's doing incredibly uh, well from a strength perspective if, and this is important, if you consider a strong dollar to be good. That alone is a thing that's not universal. In fact, most people who study currency want a weak currency. Weak currency brings jobs into your country. Strong currency means you're, you're sending jobs away. 
Uh, and so generally, uh, countries, so, so China got into a, a lot of trouble. I'll use, I don't know what trouble means on a, on a national scale, but China got into trouble uh, 10 years ago for intentionally devaluing their currency. They deflated their currency to make it worth less, to make it weaker, because that made their economy stronger, right? And that's what they wanted. They wanted more jobs, they wanted more work, they wanted to make more money. And so they did that by weakening their currency. I think the idea of currency being strong or weak sounds like who wants to be weak? You want to be strong. And so people react in that way. But that's not how weak and strong currency works. There are situations where you want to be strong and definitely situations where you want to be weak and a lot of situations where you don't care. Most of the time you don't care. And as someone who is a traveler, who is looking to be an expat, for all intents and purposes, you don't care, just as a normal American doesn't care, right? We use strong and weak currencies to do things like explain why our economy works a certain way. They are not things that we are concerned about, right, if that makes sense. Now, if the dollar suddenly becomes much stronger, our ability to live most places gets better. If it gets weaker, yes, it's a little bit harder to live places, but it doesn't tend to move very much. A weaker or stronger dollar are barely noticeable to normal people. So even when you're traveling. So it, the whole concept is one where you may want to step back and say, how does this actually potentially affect me? And what is really happening in the real world? Oh, the dollar has actually been at a historic weak point and it's moving up, but very slowly towards a slowly stronger position. Okay, what does that mean? Nothing. It means nothing to you as a traveler. Now, this was uh, expanded upon with how did I feel that this may uh, play into uh, people, for example, but you can extrapolate this, pensioners who are on a set income, which could be any retiree or anyone living off of uh, uh, annuities or, or something like that. Um, who have, they have this set income, if the dollar weakens dramatically, then their ability to, to live is going to be hampered. To answer that, I say, well, that's absolutely true. If, if the dollar weakens against the currency that you're living on, which may or may not have weakened with it, we'll get to that in a second, if the dollar in relation to that currency, not the overall value of the dollar, got weaker, then yes, you would have less to live on than you did before. But what is your alternative? What difference does it make what I think of that? That's the same as if you said, well, you lived in America and there's inflation. Now those people who are on fixed incomes have less money. What do you think of that? Well, that's how inflation works, right? The value of your money goes up and down and the amount you have to live on is the amount that they give you, right? Like there's, there's not much to have opinion about there. And I think I can only guess that somewhere under the hood, there's this feeling of, should you not move abroad? Ooh, we're gonna have a lot of wind all of a sudden. I think the worry is, should you be worried about moving abroad? Because what if the dollar becomes weak? Okay, but that's really not of concern. Like we said before, the dollar doesn't move all that much, what matters is how far your money will go, and your money goes so much farther other places, other than America, other than Canada, other than Western Europe, that it doesn't matter if the dollar became worth half what it is today, you still would go farther somewhere else, and it's never gonna be half, right? It's gonna go down by a percentage or two, maybe even 5%. So, okay, so let's talk about what we mean by a weak dollar. What we mean by a weak dollar is that the US dollar is worth less on average against a collection of all the world's currencies. Maybe we don't use all of them, but a lot of them. A huge set of global currencies taken together have risen versus the dollar. Now remember, all these things float. All of them float, right? There's none that are, there's no such thing as a, as a, as a reference standard. The dollar is the closest thing that there is to a reference standard. And if the dollar is the reference standard, you can make an argument that there's no such thing as a strong or a weak dollar, only the dollar. Now, in reality, there is, right? but it's the entire world going up or down versus the dollar. But this is their currency, not their economy, right? So the entire concept of it being worth more or worth less is very, very fuzzy, right? People tend to want to use this as a proxy for other information, but it is not. It means nothing on its own. Never, never concern yourself with currencies around the world unless it's something like a currency collapse, right? Argentina went into a currency collapse because of a total uh, financial system meltdown. Okay, that is something you worry about. Zimbabwe had runaway inflation that completely crippled the country. That you worry about. But those are very isolated incidents and it has, you know, of hundreds of countries in the world, only a few have had anything like that happen in the last many decades, right? And these are, these are very small economies on, on those kinds of scales. And there are countries who do not use, or do not have a currency that's used other places to help buffer. Like there's just a lot that makes those potential uh, candidates for those kinds of problems. 
and and even if you were to say but what if that happened to the us dollar the answer would be and what are you going to do about it how are you going to best buffer against that your best option is to not be in the place where the world is falling apart so if that's what you're trying to do the answer is the same get to a place like nicaragua like laos like you know, someplace that is cheap and safe and you're able to live for, for much better on less money. Okay, so when we say in a, in a relative useful sense that the dollar is stronger or weaker, it is against an exact currency that we're working with. So if you're gonna go travel to England, right, and they use pounds sterlings there, and uh, pounds sterling there, and uh, the dollar sometimes is $2 to the pound, sometimes it's $1 to the pound. That's a huge difference, mostly because the pound fluctuates a lot, not because the dollar does. They both fluctuate, but the pound fluctuates far more. It is a tiny currency compared to the dollar. So it's much, it's much more unbound. Plus they went through the Brexit, which really messed up the currency. So that fluctuates a lot. So a trip to England may be really expensive or pretty moderate depending on the current value of the pound. But most of the time it's worth about uh, $1.60 to the pound and it, it doesn't, when it hits two or one, those are extreme circumstances. Yes, things like that, you do need to be aware that traveling to England could go up or down. The euro is sometimes worth just over a dollar, sometimes about a dollar twenty-five. Again, if it's worth just over a dollar, you're getting a 25% cheaper vacation to Europe Okay, those things are, those are currencies that are not tied and it is versus each other. It doesn't matter if the dollar went up or the euro went down, right? It doesn't matter if the dollar went up or the sterling went down, that it's strong or weak is, is the combination of the two against each other. So one could hold steady, the other might move. They might both move. They might both go down, but as long as they both go down together, your relative strength is the same. Right, so this is all about relative numbers. The concept of like, we have a strong dollar is all but meaningless because you're not traveling to the entire world. You have to pick one particular place. And a lot of places uh, use the dollar. So uh, Ecuador or El Salvador or Panama, they use the dollar. So the dollar is not strong or weak there. It just is the dollar. If you're coming to a place like Nicaragua, we have a loose peg on the dollar, meaning that our currency here, the Cordoba, has traditionally actually been pegged to the dollar. That doesn't mean that it's one to one. It's been about 34 to one. And over time, that creeps. It's a creeping peg. Uh, and it's currently worth just over 36 to the dollar. Now, it's not technically pegged anymore, but it is loosely pegged. And it's still, if the dollar goes up or down, the Cordoba goes up and down with it. Maybe not in exactly a, a lockstep, but essentially. So the concept, the entire question, what if the dollar gets weak? It doesn't matter because it doesn't get weak compared to the Cordoba. The Cordoba gets strong or weak along with the dollar. Now, if the dollar went completely wild, the Cordoba may unpeg from it and float freely, at which point, yes, it, it may get strong and the dollar get weak. That is, that is a change of economic condition. And so many things would change at that point that worrying about it isn't realistic. You can't worry about every possible what if, especially if it's something that's never happened before, is unprecedented, or is unpredictable. So I hope that helps with the why you don't care about currencies, except for in extreme circumstances, and you would definitely know. I'm going to Argentina, their currency's out of control. Okay, work in dollars, right? And that's all you need to know. Just don't convert and your dollars are dollars. So the additional question was asked, well, if it's not currency, what makes the dollar strong? in, for example, Latin American countries. And I think there's a misunderstanding here, so I wanna go into it a little bit. The dollar isn't strong in Latin American countries. I'm not sure what, what the source of that was, but it's, it doesn't work that way. The dollar is normal in Latin American countries. In individual country here or there, it may be kind of strong just because like in Argentina, their currency got really weak and the dollar stayed normal. So the dollar is just normal, but the Argentinian uh, peso, I think it is, got really weak. Okay. In that case, you refer to it as the Argentinian peso is weak. I think it's the peso. I really hope it is. Um, and not that the dollar is strong. And if you come to Nicaragua or Ecuador or a country that in some way uses the dollar or a peg of the dollar, it is not at all strong or weak at all. So that the expression that it is strong or weak in Latin America can never apply because too much of Latin America is pegged to the dollar that it never happens that way. Now, for example, the dollar is weak compared to the Mexican peso and Mexico is the largest economy in Latin America. So we already established that a bunch of places are pegged to the dollar and are not strong or weak. And Mexico being the biggest ec economy and population in Latin America, they are really strong right now. So if you're Mexican being paid from the US, 
you're getting paid less uh, if you're paid in US dollars uh, than normal because the dollar, even though the dollar is still getting stronger, the peso is out pacing it, not out pesoing it, that's what I am tempted to say, uh, out pesoing the dollar uh, and is much, much stronger uh, than the dollar has been in relative terms. The other thing that's important to note is currencies are just exchange formats. They have no intrinsic value, none at all, absolutely none. And I know you're gonna say, but Scott, doesn't, the moment you say but, something is wrong. There's no intrinsic value to currency, none. It is an interchange format. It is not like gold that carries its own value because if it can use before manufacturing or jewelry or whatever. Currency has no value except that assigned to it. So when you look at and please take a moment and repeat this with me. Pause the video if you have to. Write this down. Put it on your hand to get a tattoo if you must. Never read anything into the exchange rate of currency. Ever. Anything. Nada. Okay? The fact that a dollar is worth 36 Cordobas tells you literally butkus. There is nothing you can tell me about the size of the economy from that, the health of an economy, the, the situation. You can't even tell the situation of the currency from that. Nothing. Because both of those things are arbitrary numbers. They Both countries arbitrarily took a currency, arbitrarily picked a name, arbitrarily picked how to divvy it up, and just slapped numbers on pieces of paper. Then later, the exchange rate between countries is established by banks, and that is based off of what people are currently willing to use it for and what they're willing to exchange it for and what they can buy with it. So if it costs $1 for a gallon of milk in the United States and it costs 36 Cordoba for a gallon of milk in Nicaragua and it's easy to get milk between those places, eventually that will set the currency because everyone will go to one place, buy milk, and then move it to the one that's more expensive if you can't and it'll equalize itself out. So over time, it has fixed itself after hundreds of years of rapid trading, computers do all day long look for the slightest little 0.0001% discrepancy in the exchange rates. And if they exist, it will quickly trade money and goods to take advantage of that until it goes away. So the difference is so minuscule and is only different for such a short period of time that essentially they all trade at equal value. So it is just arbitrary numbers. Now what you can read into a little bit, if you're an economist and you spend a lot of time studying it, but still, don't is the exchange differences over time as one gets stronger and one gets weaker or whatever how they fluctuate against each other that has some slight value but the absolute numbers the fact that you know in in uh colombia it's 30,000 uh pesos to the dollar or in nicaragua it's 36 to the dollar means nothing at all and if you think about it the fact that we're using the dollar is arbitrary. What if they use, used the cent instead? Well, the Cordoba is worth 3,600 cents. Maybe that, or I'm sorry, the, the other way around, but it's, it's worth you know five cents or whatever. Suddenly it gives a completely different picture. Instead of being a fraction of something, it's multiples of something. Did we suddenly make the Cordoba worth more money? Is it more powerful? No, we just changed the name of what we're using. We simply use something that's one one hundredth the size. It doesn't matter, right? But people get caught up in these numbers thinking there must be something interesting they can read into them, but there is not. So, so don't even let that cross your mind that you're going to, to look at the exchange rate or look at the name or look at the how it's printed or the quality of the paper and somehow figure out all these artifacts about society and economy and health and growth and the future and panic and worry and, and all the, none of that exists in there. It is all fabricated in our minds and it is an emotional reaction to to, we see things like large bills and it sounds like a lot of money. Being a Colombian millionaire sounds like a really good deal. It's like, I don't know, it's like, like a, you know, a double minimum wage income household in the United States, right? It's, it's a millionaire in Colombian pesos, but it's only going to buy you a, a tiny apartment and, and you're going to have to cook for yourself at home, right? It's all about the, the value under the hood, not about the, the, the number of zeros written on the piece of paper. So. Where does your dollar go farther? Why do we say expressions like this and what does it mean? So in that expression, we don't mean the dollar goes farther. We mean your money goes farther. And what we mean is that in the United States, things are very expensive. And when we go other places, they are much cheaper. 
And so we're able to buy more. We can buy one egg for a dollar. It's probably not true, but you buy an egg for a dollar in the United States, you can buy a dozen for a dollar in Nicaragua. Neither of those things are true. It's, it's probably less than a dollar in the US and more, but it's still, you can get a lot more eggs for the same money in Nicaragua. Well, why is that? Why, is, why does your money go farther in a different country? even a country that is pegged to the dollar, and in the case of Nicaragua, optionally uses a dollar. And actually, that's a great example because we're a dual currency country, not officially, but effectively. You can use dollars anywhere instead of Cordoba or vice versa, and it's purely an exchange rate. You don't use one to get more value. If, you, if that was a thing, everyone would opt to get paid in dollars. And if somehow getting paid in dollars meant you made more money, then everyone would do it. And you say, well, not every employer would do it. Well, they don't have to. People would just take whatever currency they were making, go to the bank and say, I want dollars for this. And like magic, they would have more money. But then everyone would take all their money and just turn it into dollars and have more money. And magically, everyone would be rich on dollars. Obviously, that isn't what happens. That alone explains why those thoughts that the dollar somehow is powerful and by making money in dollars, you can do more never makes sense. Those are people who are very confused about what money is. Okay, so why? Why do Americans have so much buying power when they come to someplace like Nicaragua? This is really straightforward, actually. Ready? Americans are rich. Nicaraguans are poor. Therefore, the labor in the United States gets paid a lot more than the labor in Nicaragua, and labor plays into all goods and services you have, so the cost of everything here is cheaper, and the cost of everything in America is more expensive. That's it. That's the whole thing. Now, let's break that down in some real numbers, things you can actually use. How do we easily measure, meaning look up, the value of an entire economy and how much we make on a per person basis, which is what actually matters in most cases? So what you have is called the gross domestic product. Now this is something that they teach in, in, uh, in New York. It's 10th grade social studies, right? But it's something that no one ever uses, but you should be. This is where it starts getting useful. It's weird that in the last few years, somehow the government in the United States and the media have managed to play smoke and mirrors and look over here in three card Monty. And now we're talking about currency everywhere, which is completely irrelevant, but easy to trick people with and hiding all the things you learn in school that we should have learned and should be using every day because they're really, really useful ways to understand peoples and countries and economies. So the gross domestic product is the overall value of all goods and services made and sold within an economy. So the United States has one and it is huge, partially because the United States is a huge country, but also because it's a rich country. And Nicaragua is tiny, partially because it is a tiny country with a very small population, and also because it is a poor country. So the, the difference between the gross domestic products of the two are really dramatic. There are single Americans with a personal product greater than the entire product of Nicaragua doubled. Right? So it's easy to see that these numbers are wildly separate, wildly divergent. But of course, America has 330 plus, 350 million plus people all earning or almost all earning money. And Nicaragua only has about six and a half million. Those are very different numbers, right? The United States is something like 50 to 70, it can't be 70, 50 to 60 times the size of Nicaragua. So of course, their economy is going to be much larger. Even if they were much poorer per person, they would still have a much larger economy. But the reality is the United States is a very rich country on a per person basis. And so there is a lot, a lot of money in their economy. So the way to come up with what's known as a personal gross domestic product is simply to take the entire amount of money made in the United States and the entire number of people and divide one into the other. And you get the amount of that gross domestic product that is assigned to each person. And that is the average income of the average person. And in the United States, that's somewhere very rough in the vicinity of $50,000 per person per year. In Nicaragua, we do the same thing. We take the gross domestic product, we take the six and a half million people, we divide one into the other, and we have an individual average income of about $2,100. Now that's not average uh, salary because you have um, unemployment and those kinds of things. So they add in and the government does have some uh, ways to make money and to do things that don't involve people working. So there's, it's not exactly a, a correlation to how much you are paid, uh, but it is very closely tracked. Uh, and so this is the amount of money that exists in the economy for each person. So just over 2000 to around about 50,000 per person. So the question that is being asked, because remember a dollar is a dollar. 
So when we say that they have $2,100 per person here, and in the United States you have $50,000 per person, we literally mean that the Americans, and we're gonna, we're gonna round just a little bit here, have $24 for every dollar a Nicaraguan has on average. And so the question becomes, why do people with $50,000 have more buying power than people with $2,000? And I think simply wording it in that distilled way, taking out of the implications and just asking the base thing, why is 50,000 so much more than 2,000? The answer is simply because mathematically it is a lot more than 2,000. If you have $50,000, you have a lot more money. You can spend $2,000 more or less without thinking. But a person who only has $2,000 can never spend $2,000, right? They, they have things they have to buy, like food and shelter. They'll never be able to spend $2,000 all at once. So that is, that's what it comes down to. Now, it's true, in the United, if you live in the United States, your cost of living is so high that $50,000 could mean you're living under a bridge and in a tent, right? At least in a, in a few places. In some places, you do fine. And in Nicaragua, there's no place where $50,000 is not going to make you rich. And there are places where $2,000, you won't be able to live. But there's a lot of places where $2,000, you can. And in the United States, we use that as the reference. This is just, just a reference. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, but when we say purchase power parity, we do that in relation to the United States. So an American who makes $50,000 a year has a purchasing power parity of $50,000 a year. What that means is if you earn a dollar, how does that compare to the amount you can use that dollar to do against an American making $1 in America? So of course, Americans are one-to-one -one because they're the reference standard. Nicaraguans get somewhere between two and three dollars, closer to two, I believe, uh, dollars of buying power for every dollar that they make. So while they only make about $2,100 on average, they act as if they make five or $6,000 in American terms. If you were to, to meet these people in America and, and see them living the way they do here, you'd say, wow, they must be earning at least $5,000, not 2,000, which is still terrible, but you would see the difference because purchasing power parity means if I have $1 and I'm in America, I can buy $1 worth of goods, like I said. But if I have that same $1 in Nicaragua, I can buy two or three times as many goods or services as I could in the United States. On average, some things are more expensive, some things are cheaper. The average gets us that much more. And it's the average, you know, household labor, the average eggs, the average milk, cheese, bread, meat, whatever. And so, because of that, Nicaragua has a, has a good purchasing power parity. That means that uh, if you then take your $50,000 from the United States and move it here, it's going to feel like you have somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 of spending power. And that's amazing, right? And that's only in the things you can buy and the things you can do. As a relative to the per people around you, it's going to feel like even more. And so it's going to be a combination of things. It's going to seem like just a tremendous amount of money. Uh, whereas... Um, if a Nicaraguan moves to the United States, their money basically evaporates and they say, wow, in Nicaragua, I made just enough that I could live and I could eat and it was okay, but I moved to America with the same money and I can't even get a hotel room, I can't get an apartment, I can't feed myself at a, at a cheap, greasy diner. There's not enough money to do any of those things, right, because the purchasing power has changed. So it is um, exacerbated in how we feel when we go places that both we have absolute more buying power, meaning Americans in almost all cases, now if you go to Panama, you may end up with less, but if you go to almost anywhere in Latin America, when you show up with any American salary, any American uh, uh, pension, that money is so much larger than what the average person makes in any of those countries that we feel like our income goes a lot farther because we have more in absolute terms than the people around us. And in relative terms, nearly everywhere in Latin America, and especially places like Nicaragua, have purchasing power parities in their country that are much more than a few percentage points above the baseline in the United States. They are often double or even triple, and even the worst ones may be one and a half times America's purchasing power parity. So you have, in absolute terms, more money than most people, but in relative terms, you have so much more power than that money had for you in the United States. So if you could barely get an apartment in the U.S., you could barely feed yourself, suddenly you have a beautiful home and you're going out to fancy dinners every day. 
the absolute term makes you feel rich versus the neighbors, versus the people you meet day to day. The relative makes you feel rich versus your lifestyle previously in your home country. So they each play a different role and you could have, you, you could make you know very little in the united states move abroad and find areas where you're around people who make more money than you and so in absolute terms you may end up not necessarily feeling richer uh, but still your money goes farther so you feel like you're richer than you were in the united states but you may not always feel richer than the people around you it all depends who you're surrounding yourself with and how much income you're bringing with you. But that is why when people say your money goes farther, when they say you, you go to these countries and you feel like you're getting so much more, yes, but it's because of that it has nothing to do with currency, nothing at all, right? It is completely about the amount of money you earn and the purchasing power parity difference. Those are terms, those are things that you really should be thinking about when you're thinking about countries in any context, when you're researching on Wikipedia, when you're uh, discussing with your kids about different countries, your GDP and PPP uh, on a, a, a full economy scale is interesting just to see how big is this country, how much weight can it throw around on the global scale. So Mexico is really interesting because they're such a big country. They're one of the trillion dollar economies. So on a global scale, Mexico can throw around some serious weight. They're the 11th largest economy in the world. But mostly, that's because they're a giant country by population. Their income per person is fine. They're a middle country in that regards. They have decent incomes, but they are not a rich country. They are not a poor country. And so on a per person basis, they have one behavior. And on an economic basis, they have another behavior. Ireland is another great example. They have a individual income dramatically higher than the United States, maybe something like $80,000 per person instead of $50,000 per person. But Ireland is a tiny country, tiny compared to the US, tiny compared to uh, uh, Mexico, not very big compared to Nicaragua. And so even though they make a tremendous amount of money per person, the actual size of their economy is quite small overall still bigger than Nicaragua's, but not a large economy. And so you get a very different thing that the individuals are very rich, but the country has no economic weight on the global scale. So those are numbers you really want to internalize. That's how you want to think about countries when you're thinking about travel, because these things affect you and affect how you're going to perceive that country. Understanding, are you coming to a place where the, the, the country has a lot of influence, where the individuals have a lot of buying power? What is your buying power relative to there? That's important for you to understand how you're going to integrate, how it's going to react to you, what your opportunities are, what your opportunities are to help, uh, what their opportunities are for you, and so forth. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. Get down there in the comments. Let me know. Talk about currency, GDP, education for economics for kids, whatever. I want to hear from you. And uh, please share on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that stuff. Uh, that really helps. And uh, if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me coffee. Buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. That helps me overcome the, the working and living in Nicaragua things and all the cameras and equipment that I have to buy to be able to do this. And all of a sudden, I have flies on my head. All of a sudden, I made it this whole time without anything. And now they're like getting into my hat because like they're super interested. I will see all of you tomorrow.